Uh, welcome back. Uh, we're ready to begin our very first panel. And I would simply turn it over to Dr. Marcelo Sabatis. Uh, he's uh, head of our Office of International Programs, and he will introduce our panel, which is from our partner universities, plus our head, Socorro Herrera, who's been really uh, instrumental in all of this happening over the past few years. So, Marcelo, I will turn it over to you. Good morning, buenos días, bienvenidos para aquellos que no son uh, del campus uh, uh, Kansas State University. Welcome to Kansas State University for those who uh, are not studying or teaching or working here. Uh, it is a big pleasure and a big honor to having uh, you here. Um, uh, it's a day of uh, uh, joy uh, for all of us, uh, for those who have been involved with several programs, uh, starting with the Go Teachers program uh, over the years, over the last uh, three years or so. Um, uh, and uh, it's a day of joy, but uh, 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 the best is still to come. Uh, we have so many more things to do uh, in the future. Um, uh, it's a great, great pleasure to see here uh, the authorities from Ecuador, we are very thankful you are here um, to see the authorities of Kansas State University and the Board of Regents, uh, um, uh, government authorities, and to see our colleagues uh, from the Global Campus, from the College of Education, uh, my colleagues from the Office of International Programs, and in particular the English Language Program. Um, it's great to see uh, professors and staff from many other departments, including some deans. Uh, it's a great pleasure to see the group of Go teachers. It's a great pleasure to see the group of uh, master students, some of whom uh, we learned, like my good friend Hamilton, uh, uh, that, that we met uh, two years ago or so when they were starting, and now we see them doing, uh, doing their uh, masters. So this is really a unique opportunity for us. Um, I think that opening the first panel, it would be appropriate to reflect on two converging uh, traditions. Uh, the tradition uh, that uh, now the Ecuadorian government is reinvigorating, which is the tradition of the key role of education uh, in uh, uh, the role of the development of a nation, uh, and the tradition of Kansas State University as a land-grant university. There are parallels, strong parallels, in those two traditions. Um, let me read a quote by an independence intellectual, um, Mariano Moreno, uh, written in a prologue of uh, a translation of Rousseau's uh, social contract. Uh, Mariano Moreno, as uh, well as uh, Simon Rodriguez, who was the teacher of uh, Simon Bolivar, and many, many others, uh, um, basically developed uh, that independence uh, uh, thought uh, for Latin America. Uh, and the role of education, as the quote will illustrate, is very evident. So Moreno said, Si los pueblos no se ilustran, si no se vulgarizan sus derechos, si cada hombre no conoce lo que vale, lo que puede y lo que se le debe, nuevas ilusiones sucederán a las antiguas y después de vacilar algún tiempo entre mil incertidumbres, será tal vez nuestra suerte mudar de tiranos sin destruir la tiranía. Uh, in English now, my, my translation, uh, if the peoples do not enlighten themselves, if their rights are not, are not widely known, if each person does not know what he or she is worth, uh, can, can do or is owed, new illusions will follow the old ones, and after hesitating for some time within thousands of uncertainties, it will be perhaps our fate 
to change tyrants without destroying tyranny. Um, and you see there a quintessential independence thinking uh, 200 years ago. Education, enlightenment, is at the core of the democratic development of a nation. And uh, what uh, our friends in Ecuador are doing is continuing that tradition. Um, in about eight years or so, uh, Ecuador will be celebrating the 200th anniversary of the start of the independence struggle. Uh, I think it's uh, May 24th, uh, and it will be 2000, uh, uh, 2022 or so. Uh, it's going to be 200 years of their uh, initial movement towards independence. A couple of months later than that, uh, in Guayaquil, in Ecuador, uh, the two liberators of, uh, uh, of, Latin, of uh, South America, at least, uh, Simón Bolívar and José de San Martín, met uh, to discuss how the nations would develop uh, a democratic system. And again, education, very clearly in Bolívar, was at the core of that project. Um, when they celebrate 200 years uh, in, uh, uh, in just eight or so, they will be talking about that tradition. And I'm very sure that all the efforts that are being made, including our Do Go Teachers program, is going to have a role in that celebration. Let's look at our own history at Kansas State. We are 150 years old. We are a land-grant institution. Uh, we are an institution that was the first one created under one of the best pieces of public policy that I know of in the Americas, and that's the Morrill Act. The Morrill Act create, created public universities to educate the industrial classes uh, in the practical and liberal education. And uh, if Senator Morrill were here, uh, if uh, he would think about, reflect about, uh, w um, what uh, Vice Minister Troja um, uh, said today uh, about the pillars of their educational project, he would like it and he would say, oh, that looks like a land-grant project. So, uh, Vice Minister, you talk about relevance, quality, and democratization, and all those are at the core of the land-grant mission. Uh, as a land-grant institution, we have uh, the obligation to serve the people. And in the 21st century, that, without doubt, includes the people of the world. And it includes partnering with governments who have the same goals as we have. Relevance of education, quality, and democratization. Uh, I want to say that the best is still to come because I want to say that as a land-grant institution, we have many, many things to offer uh, for uh, partnership towards that project. We have some of the best uh, PhD programs uh, in agriculture and uh, related areas. Uh, we have extraordinary master's programs like the one that uh, your students are um, completing now, um, we offer uh, a truly welcoming, um, socially conscious a campus that is ideal for your students. And you as a country, of course, offer so many things. Uh, we are going to announce very soon that one of our programs, the Leadership Studies program, uh, is going to uh, open a track for their minor in leadership studies uh, in Ecuador. Uh, we want our students to go there. We want our professors to go there. We want, we want true interaction. We want this to be a two-way avenue of growth. Um, so um, I think it's uh, very appropriate too in this context uh, that we start with perhaps the more general and uh, conceptual uh, of all the panels today, 
uh, which is uh, uh, a reflection, a joint reflection um, uh, about uh, perspectives of international nature on globalization uh, and education. Uh, yeah, we have three panelists, uh, each of them is going to speak for about 15 minutes, and we are going to leave uh, probably 15 to 20 for uh, questions and answers at the very end. So the panelists uh, are uh, um, Dr. Uh, Cornel Menking, uh, who is Associate Provost for International Programs uh, at the uh, New Mexico State University, uh, Dr. Socorro Herrera, uh, who is uh, our own professor in the uh, College of Education and the director of the SEMA Center, uh, and uh, Dr. Holly Singh, who is the director for international students and scholars uh, at uh, Valparaiso University. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, my fellow panelists, for, for being here, and uh, sure, we'll start. Buenos dias. Good morning. My name is Cornell Minking, New Mexico State University. We are one of the uh, partner universities in the Go Teacher program. We also will be next week uh, congratulating our third group of graduating Go Teachers. So my congratulations to you, the students. I know it's a, it's a festive time for you, and I know you have worked hard because you work as hard as our students. So congratulations. Um, Today I'm going to, uh, well first, first full disclosure, uh, this, this program is very near and dear to my heart for a few very personal reasons. I lived and worked in Ecuador for seven years. My wife, Mona Minking, is one of the primary reasons this program exists, uh, both for you and for us. Um, and she is Ecuadorian, and we lived there uh, fr from uh, about 2000 to two, 2001, 2008, uh, during a very interesting time in that country's history. We were both working at Universidad San Francisco de Quito in Cumbaya, and I was the uh, director of a master's in education program and director of their international programs. So I came back to the United States to a land grant in Kentucky, and now I'm at a land grant in New Mexico, and I am just thrilled to be re-engaged in Ecuador. It's given us lots of reasons to go down there. Both of my children are, are Ecuadorian. They have Ecuadorian passports. Yo tengo cédula. <laughs> so, yeah. So, we're, we also worked with Rafael Correa at USFQ the, and um, when he was a professor of economics. So it's been very interesting, I could go on for an hour easily about observations that we have made over the years of the influence of his, 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 uh, his time at USFQ and the University of Illinois Champaign-Urbana on what he currently is doing in the country of Ecuador. It's directly influenced by his international experience, which is I think why you, the Go Teachers, are here. Uh, because he knows how powerful that study abroad experience is. But anyway, I won't drone on about that. My, uh, my task today is, do I change these? Uh, yes. And my task here today is to try to go from, uh, begin the macro and we'll go down to the micro, I think is kind of the plan. I want to introduce uh, what is, uh, well, the contributions the Go Teacher program makes to campus internationalization, I'll be speaking mostly about uh, our, our university as a, as a case study, and then uh, I'll put that in, I'll be doing that by putting the program in a, global, in, a, uh, in a national context in the United States. So I'm going to give you a quick, very quick, I'm going to try to give you a quick overview of internationalization. This is the, my favorite definition, there's a few. But I think it's worth sharing, because we've been talking about uh, the contributions of this program to internationalization. So what does that mean? So I'm just going to read this. Internationalization is the conscious effort to integrate and infuse international, intercultural, and global dimensions into the ethos and outcomes of post-secondary education. To be fully successful, it must involve active and responsible engagement of the academic community in global networks and partnerships. So I think you can, you can see how this program contributes to that. But the ethos and outcomes, that's, that's really where my mind goes. So the, 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 the institutional culture and the outcomes, where, 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 are, where, are the, uh, where are the commitments on the part of the institution to uh, producing globally prepared citizens? And why do we do that? The, the, in, in, in most uh, political contexts, the, the argument we make is an economic, competitive one, uh, economic competitiveness one. 
that in the United States, if we are going to keep up with the global economy, as, uh, as Provost Mason said just a little while ago in the press conference, we've got to be globally, our students have to be globally prepared and globally engaged. So, well, that's probably the fastest I ever covered that topic. Um, these are the, the uh, these are some, some, uh, uh, some, some indicators of what an internationalized university looks like. I'm gonna, I put them up here now. I'm gonna go back to them after, after, at the end of the presentation, but you can see kind of what they are. Is the institution committed? Is there structure and staffing? Is there, is there money to support this? Are, are foreign languages and, and, uh, and, and, and uh, area studies being offered? Uh, and, and required? Uh, are people studying abroad? Are there policies and opportunities for faculty? Uh, are there, uh, uh, what, what's happening in student activities and services and how is in, uh, technology being used? So some of these, th this program contributes to and some of them not so much. Um, so real quick, just a snapshot of what's happening in the United States. So since post-World War II, uh, the idea of, of internationalizing a university uh, was pretty much, are our students going abroad? Are our students learning about, in that period, really, are they learning about Europe, our former enemies? And so we were sending lots of people to Europe. You can see over the, uh, well, this only goes back to 89, 90. It would go way back here and it would continue to go up. But um, you can see how this, this number is increasing. And uh, the, the latest number, it, it continues to increase, 283,000. Where are they going? Well, you can see here on the left, the big numbers still tend to be Europe. Um, you can see Ecuador, I pointed out there, that's students going to Ecuador. This data is a couple, this particular slide, that is a couple years old, but I'd say it's probably hasn't changed too much in terms of where our students are going. Maybe a few more to China now. Um, and incoming students, where, where do international students come from that come to the United States? Uh, uh, or sorry, how many? First, how many are coming? You can see, again, since the 50s, it's been a steady increase uh, in students coming to the United States. This last year, record growth in the latest report that just came out, 7% growth. It's a record high. So the United States is still, we still enjoy being one of the most popular places on the planet for international people to come and study. And I have my, 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 my argument for that is that we are really still good at at, at, at fostering critical thinking. We think it's okay to ask questions in the classroom. And that's a, that's a model of uh, education that still, in many ways, is unique. Uh, and we, as a re we, I believe, and I think many would make the case, as a result, our, our, our country is still a leader in innovation, because we're creative. And I think, we, we think that starts in the classroom. Anyway, um, Latin America, uh, as a source of students for US universities. Now again, this particular slide, the data's a little old. I, uh, uh, well, well, there's Latin America. I think it's gone up in Latin America, but you still, you can see Asia's dominant. And this one, I really think would be different if I had this year's data incorporated. I had trouble putting my finger on it. Ecuador has had a dramatic increase, as the ambassador was mentioning, uh, has had a dramatic increase in, in, in students studying abroad, in, in, uh, not only in the United States, uh, but around the world. So, but this is United States numbers, but I would venture to say that that number uh, is gonna be considerably higher, maybe a thousand or so higher uh, the total for Ecuador. But you can see the big countries are Mexico, uh, Brazil, uh, Colombia, um, but Ecuador's holding their own there in Peru. Um, what do they study? I thought this was interesting to mention. Um, you can see business management, engineering, math, uh, and many of these are you know, coming from Asian and Middle Eastern countries. You can see the proportion there, 22%, 19%. Jump over to education, 2%. Uh, so uh, that feeds into my greater point here in a second. But uh, that's what they're studying. Um, non-degree, uh, what, what, what types of students are there? Look at non-degree, only 9% of students, and this is new data, there's only 9% of the international students are studying in non-degree programs. These are the top states. So you can see Texas, California, and New York uh, host 32% of international students in, in, the, uh, in the United States. Uh, where, so you can see the title there. Kansas, New Mexico, Kentucky, not on there. So they're really going to, uh, to uh, these, these heavy, 
more heavily populated areas and, and well known. I know when I was living and working in Ecuador, the definition of studying in the United States meant Miami or Boston, maybe New York. So uh, there's a, it's a big country. So, um, so this is my, my greater point that the Go Teacher program is atypical. And I think that's a very good thing. It's Latin American, in particular Ecuadorian. Um, this, is a, this is an area where I think it's safe to say most of my colleagues around the country, my colleagues being the senior international officers at American universities, would love to be engaged in Latin America the way that Kansas State, New Mexico State, Kentucky, Valpo are all engaged. It's, it's, it's very unique to have so many Latin Americans on your campus and people are envious. They love it. Because um, I don't know, for whatever reason, it's, it's hard, generally, very generally speaking, it's hard for American universities to get so many Latin Americans, <clears throat> South Americans in particular. It's, uh, it's pedagogical. It's, it's about you know, teaching English and English uh, for speakers of other languages. You saw 2% of the, of the people studying, of international students are, are studying in education. So this is a big boost for our College of Education and I'm, I'm guessing for yours as well. It's just that the international activity tends to be in engineering and business, et cetera. Um, and I don't know if you noticed, but agriculture is also very low. I, that surprised me because we have so much to share as, as land grants. But uh, there's really not that much international exchange, study exchange happening in, in, in that field either. Um, it's non-credit, you saw, 9%, only 9%, so it's atypical in that regard. It's a, it's a short seven-month contract. That's a unique model. Uh, it's, uh, well, and I mentioned it's conducted in those states, uh, land-grant institutions. And there's, there's no real reciprocal component to this. There's a little bit of a, of a follow up of, of the teachers in the classrooms back in Ecuador, but there's not a, a heavy reciprocal element, which most partnership programs tend to have. So back to that first slide. I, I, I made some very broad generalizations here, so I apologize if, if any of you think these are incorrect. But uh, these are the things I think we, you know, that this program does. It definitely contributes to institutional commitment. Uh, actually, let me just go through these and give you examples of how it does this. So in, in, the, in the category of institutional commitment, I know that at our university, there has been an increased awareness in, uh, in our, it's called Hadley Hall, it's in our president's building, the president and provost building, uh, of, 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 of the importance of international engagement. I took our, pre our provost to Ecuador. We visited the Goya Chai project. We now have a contract with Goya Chai. We, we have a visiting hotel restaurant tours and management students. Uh, the, pres the provost was just absolutely uh, enthralled with the kinds of things that, that uh, Maria Pilar and, uh, and the ambassador were talking about. That this, this level of investment in, in, uh, in education was, was, it, it, it was very impressive to our, to our provost. Um, and as a result, he's excited and, and, and supportive. And our president's been affected. Everybody's really been effective. So it, I think it has affected institutional commitment. Uh, organizational structure and staffing. It's forced us to hire a lot of people to support this program. And that has, that has caused uh, sort of a, a strengthening of, of the infrastructure that supports international education. Um, I'll spare you the details. Financial support, the program is lucrative. I mean, we're, we're, it's, it's, they're paying F&A, uh, they're using our, our housing, they're eating in our cafeteria, you are eating in their cafeteria. And, uh, and that's good for the university, you know, it, it, it's, it's been good financially um, and, and gets me some more support for, for the other deeper internationalization goals. Um, foreign language requirements offerings. I, I, maybe I should have put a little question mark there, I don't know, but uh, how does this contribute to our foreign language and offerings? It really hasn't affected it. We have tried to get our Ecuadorians engaging in Spanish language with some of our, our students, and, uh, but I think we could do better there. Um, uh, Course requirements and offerings. We, I, I put a check mark there because we have used uh, the Ecuadorians on campus to, to participate in classes, uh, in, in practicums, and visit classrooms. So I put a green check there. Um, it, it contributes to that. Education abroad, as I said, we're not sending any American students to Ecuador, so it's not part of it. We, we hope that that increases. Uh, faculty policies and opportunities, kind of a question mark. We, we want, our, our faculty are, are keenly aware of the presence of the Ecuadorians, and there's some are inviting them to their classrooms and such, but I wouldn't go so far as to say it's, it's really creating 
uh, any improved policies or, or significant opportunities for our, for our faculty. We hope, with the, uh, maybe with the Chai project, we did send a team down there to consult with them on, on that innovative university, so we'll see. Um, uh, student activities and services, I, the, the list is long. The, uh, we, we involve the Ecuadorians in all kinds of extracurricular activities as well as curricular. They, they perform at, uh, and I'm sure it happens here too, they perform at our festival, they come and, and give talks, they, um, oh, the list is so long, I'm just, um, they, they, in our cafeteria, here's a great example of how we combined the, the, the infrastructure and, and, and student involvement. The Ecuadorians have an Ecuadorian day now. It's become a tradition in our cafeteria, which we have a Sodexo, we have an outside provider. And they come and they, they, they basically provide a cultural performance during lunch one day. And the, and the people in the cafeteria have learned to cook uh, yapingachos and fritada. And so it's, it's very interesting. It's not really the yapingachos and fritada, but they try. <laughs> um, but it's, but you know, it's just everybody's awareness is, is increasing about the Ecuadorians, what is Ecuadorian culture, so that's wonderful. And I can't think of any ways it's really contributing to, to technology. Um, uh, so, the, oh, the kind of broad uh, conclusions here, it takes the emphasis off travel and helps us with internationalization at home. Again, at many universities, internationalization is thought of as as international travel. Did somebody go somewhere? Did somebody come from somewhere? This has, been, this has given us opportunities for internationalization at home, bringing the world to southern New Mexico, as we like to say, and I just gave examples of that. And it's forced growth and maturation of the internationalization process in ways I just uh, explained. Um, and, and this might be the, the biggest point. The benefits, and maybe this is a, uh, speaking to, to my colleagues out there, um, that the benefits depend on the degree to which we take advantage of these opportunities. And that's, that's, that's been hard. It's, you know, so we sit around, we say, you know, God, what can we do? Wow, we have you know, 80 Ecuadorians on campus. How can we, how can we also take advantage of that? Um, and so we strive to find creative ways to leverage their presence. And I would like to repeat what, what uh, Dr. Mason said in the press conference, that I, I also believe that this program has in many ways affected us maybe more than it has affected the GO teachers, although I hope you, they've learned a lot of English and, and good methods. I'll close with this. This is a transition, hopefully, for the benefit of, uh, of, our, of Socorro, our next presenter. I love this quote. I had to share it, and I love that picture. That picture is a photograph from a, a village called Palenque, just outside of, uh, of uh, um, uh, oh, um, uh, not Cali, um, Cartagena, thank you. I knew Mona would know. Uh, outside of Cartagena. It was a village uh, formed by freed, sorry, escaped slaves. So they took off across the, the savannah and just kept running until they thought it was safe and they set up a village. And they've got the, and it's, and it's a basically a fully African tradition village. And they've got this incredibly powerful statue outside their, outside, at the, at the, at the, you know, the entrance of their village. And I just love it as a symbol of, of, of freedom, breaking the chains. And I think that internationalization uh, uh, is the ultimate, ultimate liberal arts tool to help us break out of our old mental models and, and, and think in new ways. Because if we don't, we're slaves to how we, how we, the only one way of thinking. And so this, this quote uh, kind of sums that up for me. How shall I talk of the sea to the frog if it has never left his pond? Uh, how shall I talk of the frost to the bird of the summer land if it's never left the land of its birth? And finally, how shall I talk of life with the sage if he is a prisoner of his own doctrine? So the, the Go Teacher program for us has, has brought the world and hopefully opened many minds. So I think Socorro is going to continue on the uh, topic of, uh, of culture and, and such. Thank you. Buenos días. Primero quiero empezar para decirles que embajadora Celi, Pilar, profesor Álvarez, inmediatamente en conocer los cinco minutos anoche se sintió que traen a Ecuador en el alma. Y es lo importante de todo lo que estamos llevando a cabo ahorita. First and foremost, in the five minutes that I met them last night, I could immediately tell them that these great leaders of Ecuador have Ecuador in their soul. And the work that is taking place is exactly 
bound by the love and the commitment and the passion of the teachers that we've seen here. As uh, was shared in the press conference, currently we have the Go Teacher Masters and are working with Yachai. I don't have a cedula, but I'm trying to figure out how to get it quickly. <laughs> because for those of you who know me, I have been trying and asking everyone, where's the best place to live? The food is amazing. And then I want to take the whole university, but Dean Mercer doesn't seem to want to fund it. So maybe, maybe Provost Mason will do it for us. And we had the opportunity to take our first eight undergraduates, and they came. Um, they fell in love with the country. And so I think that as we continue this to build this relationship, we'll continue to learn and, and love uh, more and more about Ecuador and the amazing people. That being said, they gave me 15 minutes. I probably have already used two. So instead of talking and keeping with my Latina roots and telling lots of stories and being random abstract, I'm going to be very linear and share with you my thoughts and my philosophy. First and foremost, I am a bilingual educator. So when Embajadora Celi talks about the indigenous communities in Ecuador, it speaks to my heart because of our indigenous communities here in the United States, our ever uh, ongoing fight for bilingual education and biculturalism, and I think the potential of continuing to have exchanges with other countries and to look at our own domestic students and where bilingual education and bilingual, uh, bi biculturalism fits will actually move us forward into the 21st century and the global world that we'd like to see. So I'm going to share my thoughts, but I'm not going to tell any stories. Global, globalization in higher education is the pivotal challenge in today's world that necessitates a commitment to infuse international and comparative perspectives throughout the research, professional development, teaching, and service missions of higher education. In the race to achieve the goals presented by globalization, many U.S. institutions of higher education are inadequately, inadequately prepared to handle the complexities that arise, and many of us have been privy to those complexities as, we've, as the Go Teacher program has unfolded over the last two and a half years. In fact, according to NAFSA, many international students who attend U.S. institutions of higher education are disappointed with their educational experiences including some who attend these institutions with large number of international students. Well, what is it that makes us unhappy? The pizza, <laughs> the transportation, the spicy food. <laughs> we're gonna talk about that, not for everyone, but we're gonna talk about that tomorrow. <clears throat> the English language is the lifeblood of globalization. It is, as it is the dominant language of business, technology, science, and the internet. In fact, almost half of all research that is published in, is published in the English language, and almost 90% of research in the sciences. The development and history of the English language is long and complex, yet is flexible and adaptable. The language uh, belongs to those who use it. According to the Global Language Monitor, English is about to acquire its millionth word and is continuously changing. While English has become vital for the world's economic system, we need to look beyond those characteristics. English should be acknowledged as capacity building for cognition. Research at, uh, New York, University, at York University in Toronto claims that bilingualism accentuates the executive control center of the human brain and enhances capacities for planning, focusing, multitasking, and problem solving. It is important to recognize that the English language acquisition and human development go hand in hand. It is the human element of internationalization and globalization that is important here. Charlie Maine has said, to have another language is to possess a second soul. American writer and feminist Rita Mae Brown says, language is the roadmap of a culture. It tells its people, uh, it, it tells you where its people come from and where they are going. Understanding others' language and cultures is key to the higher education institution's relevance in the global era. Cross-cultural sensitive, sensitive individuals are essential to business, governments, and research in the global marketplace. 
Diverse critical thinking skills are pivotal to complex postmodern challenges to achieve the needs and goals presented by global interdependence. To reach global interdependence, we must acknowledge the challenges. How do we provide educational opportunities to all populations, including students and teachers from the most rural and impoverished areas? My passion to go teacher and to the master's program is that I see the potential of reaching the most rural areas in Ecuador, of working with indigenous populations that may otherwise not have the top most qualified teachers. How do we provide technological access to those who desperately want to join us in the global conversation? How might we establish off-campus centers of pr uh, primary and secondary education? What of these questions can we see uh, out of these questions, we can see the positives of globalization on our own educational system. In fact, these questions cannot be answered without the open dialogues among influential local and national policy, policy holders, school administrations, and those practicing in the classroom. And I would say that for those of us practicing in the classroom, it becomes of utmost important to be an advocate. How many of you go teachers have heard advocacy, advocacy, advocacy in your program? Ya están cansados, ¿verdad? Pero la embajadora, si no platican con ella de las necesidades, ella no puede platicar con el presidente. ¿Verdad que es verdad? So, advocacy. However, it is with these ongoing conversations that allow for worldwide networks of common ideas and practices, information sharing and e-learning, and the consistent monitoring of migration effects on national and local education policies. Ultimately, sharing common goals, even if broadly defined, is what will allow us to meet the needs of our students and teachers. Bilingualism and biculturalism, let's all say that together, bilingualism and biculturalism is how we will grow together. While English proficiency is important in this area, era, it is obviously not the only necessary component for internationalization. I want you to leave with that thought today. In his 2001 Nobel Prize address, Kofi Annan summed it best when he said, we must ensure that the global market is embedded in broadly shared values and practices that reflect global social needs and that the world's people share the benefits of globalization. And that is exactly why we must nourish the mind, nourish the soul. Bilingualism and biculturalism respects heritage, which is the soul. The home language, which captures the heart, and English language acquisition, which encompasses the mind. By holding on to, uh, on to putting this motto into action, we will get the ultimate human potential. Embajadora Celi, you talked about the human potential, and I think I'm not a political person, but your president has it right. When he explores the multiple ways that sending students abroad, preparing English teachers to work with families and students, will enhance the human potential and the economic power of the country. We must move beyond merely talking about research, professional development, teaching, and service missions in higher education. Rather, we must encourage, mold, and foster the reciprocity that is born out of bilingualism and biculturalism. Concentrating on the human relationships when form, that are formed when two groups come together. Now that is an everlasting bond. So what does this mean for Kansas State University, New Mexico State? I'm almost done. I'm almost done. Ya, les dije que me iba a decir afuera. So what does it mean for Kansas State University and our uh, uh, New Mexico State, Valparaiso, and University of Kentucky? and our partnership with Ecuador. At the beginning of this initiative, the primary focus was to create an enriching and intensive English language development program for our Ecuadorian GO teachers. However, it is necessary to recognize that the knowledge obtained is not one-sided. We at all the universities that are participating in these programs are not merely responsible for providing English language development. 
Rather, this initiative has blossomed into a fully reciprocal relationship, one in which both partners consistently learn from each other. We have gained just as much knowledge from you, if not more, than we have provided the GO teachers and currently the master students. Thank you for allowing us to foster this relationship together in order to continue to build on that unbreakable bond. Con todo mi cariño y todo mi amor, you don't know how much you've taught me to the GO teachers and the master's people and the visits to your country. Thank you very much. Honorable Ambassador, Vice, Vice Minister, Associate Provost Menking, Sabates, Dr. Herrera, and my friends in the audience. My name is Holly Singh. I'm the Director of International Students and Scholars and Executive Director of Global Leadership Institute at Valparaiso University, which is a comprehensive institution loca located in Northwest Indiana, about an hour outside of Chicago. I want to talk today about the practical approach to international education student scholar experiences at the confluence of culture. I was an international student once, so I feel that I've always remained an international student who sees an immense potential of education at the confluence of cultures. By confluence, I mean the meeting point where one culture touches another as a student scholar leaves from one to enter another. These are those imaginary borders, borders that seem so real for a simple reason that every culture distinguishes itself from the other and thus becoming a barrier in a student's international education journey. As we all know, the majority of education happens outside of the classroom. The daily living in a foreign land and culture can teach us a lot to a novice. These first few weeks of struggle, especially when you come in the middle of January and you happen to be from a country on the equator, could become the defining point of your experience in a foreign land. <laughs> With the globalization of education, it is certain that the student scholar from one country will travel to another. It is also certain that they will come across people who are different, people who may not be open or welcoming of the different. And then the two will react to that difference. What is not certain is how they would react, whether in positive or negative ways. It is also not certain that this experience will be a life-changing experience, and in fact, may just become another natural transitioning part of human living, a sort of rite of passage, which may be good in, in the long run. We, the audience here, make one half of this cultural exchange with the other. A clash or a confluence of cultures, therefore, is up to us. My talk today will concentrate on the, our practical experiences with the other, the international, and the approach that we as social change agents can apply to make a difference. Let me start by an example. Um, during our, our orientation for our new international students and scholars at Valparaiso, we, uh, we, have a, we host a lunch with all our resident assistants, majority of them are Americans. And we share a, a document uh, called, Why Do Americans Act That Way? U.S. cultural values and the impact on American behavior. Uh, th there are certain things about Americans, you know, that, that are different. So the, the document lists about 13 things and the Americans take, that the Americans take it for granted. Uh, let me pick one example, the idea of uh, individualism. individualism. So individual se individualism seems very unique to the American ethos due to our many historical factors. But it may not dawn on us that the rest of the world considers this as at varying levels on the spectrum. While in the, in the West we insist on separate individuals making separate choices, many cultures in the East and to the South of us rely on collective decision-making activities. That seems so foreign. The instilled value uh, for us Americans is to make our next generation as independent as possible, you know, starting almost as junior high and high school while parents in many cultures keep making choices for their children well into the college. Our insistence on individual choice also comes with its own sets of problems. To the rest of the world, Americans seem very self-centered 
and many a times isolated and lonely. What we value as a very important culture value, individualism, is seen here at a, as a selfish tendency and a reason for the American paranoia. The whole concept of professional counselors, for example, is strange to many cultures, that they would never think of seeking help or therapy, and that, that also comes attached with a certain stigma. As you can see, the one cultural attribute is leading to the, another cultural uh, structural construct that is so much part of our society. The most important part that I drive during our orientation lunch with the RAs is the fact that the internationals, in a similar fashion, hold certain truths that may be diagrammatically different than the ones listed above. The idea about sharing values of the host culture helps internationals to evaluate their own background and understand how to maneuver their next few months and years in the new society. Many internationals come to expect the Americans would welcome them when they initially arrive. Their expectations are not unreal, as they would have done so if a foreigner was to come to their country. In fact, they would go out of their way to ask a foreigner if they needed any help. But as we listed some of the values above that we hold near and dear, like the insistence on independence and privacy, makes us not take the first step towards the stranger, even if the other person looks foreign and certainly lost. Obviously, the international is hoping for some domestic student uh, to ask and, you know, about their situation and intervene in their predicament. The aha moment at that lunch happens when both Americans and internationals realize that they would need to come out of their comfort zone and take the first steps to facilitate the cross-cultural interaction. Due to their deep-seated cultural values, they insisted earlier not to take the first step. But now, just the knowledge of knowing that this was not the norm in another culture, they were at least entertaining the idea of taking the first step. The journey on this cultural roller coaster starts way earlier than the student stepping onto another country. Their pre preconceived ideas of a certain culture are already established by the time the student is right on track for experiencing culture shock. By insisting in his mind certain realities of another culture. So one of the first steps on this journey will be to face these preconceived notions. Many internationals, student scholars, have seen the United States through the eyes of our popular media. Their understanding of our culture may involve fast cars and gun-carrying vigilantes all over the place. And then they end up at K-State or New Mexico State University or Valparaiso University. With Valpo, at least they're an hour away from the capital of Al Capone and the Prohibition era time, but you know, it doesn't help. To tackle some of the cross-cultural issues, we sometimes try to send info ahead of time for our incoming students. While this is a helpful exercise, a lot depends on the other culture in terms of whether that info will, info will be used and how it will be gauged. As the intracultural adjustment roller coaster shows up here, there are many, fa many facets of the adjustment to, the, to a new culture. Although this happens with different people at different times and in different phases, it is pretty certain that the individuals go through similar, something similar from initial phases of fascination and surface adjustment to certain integration in due time while experiencing the lows of initial shock and later the mental isolation. Finally, as evident, uh, the whole adjustment process is not an overnight deal, and in fact, takes many years. For our GO teachers, we have seven months for this adjustment to take place, in spite of the rigorous nature of their academic portion. It is always a great pleasure to share success stories with students that have excelled in their studies. You, the GO teacher, are our bright future, and it is good to see that you have achieved so much in a short duration. Our common pursuit and future looks good because of you, and let me try to explain what I mean by that. In this world of division and constant clash of civilizations, our moving forward seems very uncertain, uncertain and troublesome. 
progressive nations like Ecuador and the United States may come to stand still in their relations with each other due to local realities that they face. While thinking globally, both nations realize that they have their individual constituents, that they have expectations, and they have expectations that differ in nature. Only an educated younger generation that has trained in another culture can bridge this gap of misunderstanding and trust, distrust. These globalized citizens see the world in relative terms and can understand the nature of local politics while thinking concurrently for the benefit of the whole world. The same younger generation of high achievers are the need of every nation. Further, this group of student scholars that has been empowered by experiencing higher education in another country is able to see the reality from the other's perspective. When this next, gen next generation feels empowered to change their country and the world, then the miracle of global peace is possible. You, the Go teacher, are that bright st star in the sky that every nation needs to shed light on the pathway. I congratulate you on your success and best of luck for your future endeavors. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, about eight to 10 minutes for a few questions, so feel free to ask to the whole panel or any particular panelist. I was uh, just curious, this question maybe for Mr. Whoops. Yep. For Mr. Mankin, um, I'm wondering what things have kept Americans from going to Ecuador? You mentioned that was a problem or you just noticed that, that there wasn't much reciprocity. I just, I just meant in this case, it's not built into the, this particular program. That was kind of my broader point. Um, but uh, um, I think, Americans, there's increased mobility to, to South America by Americans, but uh, there's still this perception somehow that it's uh, difficult to break into to Latin America. But no, in this case, I just meant it's not specifically, there, there's not reciprocal student mobility built into the program, whereas in most, most partnerships, there is, there is a reciprocal student element built in. That's all I meant by that. I would like to mention that the, the frog in a, in a pond story is true here, because uh, you know how do you tell uh, to a frog in a pond what the sea is like? So only a person who's gone back and forth can really talk about uh, what it means to study abroad. I mean, our Ecuadorians can tell us, but you know I can tell, they can tell, but a typical American, for example, who's grown in the Midwest, would he really value study abroad? I'm not sure. Any other question? Did they know a joke? No. <laughs> well, I'm just going to add, in our case in the College of Education, we are having reciprocity um, at multiple levels. Actually, not only working with Yachai and going back to classrooms and doing, uh, you know, with undergraduates, um, but also working with uh, La Universidad Tecnica del Norte uh, in, at, at, like I said, at multiple levels. So we are seeing a flow in the College of Education or attempting to set up those, that infrastructure to have it ongoing. Eric's first. There's, there's another question behind um, In answer to your, uh, if you, are you a faculty member? or um, Proyecto Prometeo, mm -hmm. put a plug in right here because they mentioned it, is a great opportunity, even though it's not technically built into the program, Proyecto Prometeo is an opportunity for faculty um, to go to Ecuador and they fully fund it. It is a fully funded research experience in Ecuador for faculty. So if there are faculty members um, here, definitely take advantage of it because that will help prevent being the frog. Chris, I know you love frog. That's the only reason I say that. But um, I think that it's a great opportunity that the Ecuadorian government it's not specifically built into GoTeacher, but they have given us lots of uh, opportunities to encourage 
all partner university faculty and staff to participate in Proyecto Prometeo so that they have an opportunity to go. And like Dr. Herrera just mentioned, um, in the College of Ed, we are um, starting these study abroad trips for students to go to Ecuador. And, and I'm gonna say, I know faculty at New Mexico State and staff at New Mexico State are traveling to mm -hmm. Ecuador just to visit Go Teachers. So um, on a social level, there is a lot of travel happening to Ecuador as a result of the experience of all of you being here. So make and friends and invite them to Ecuador. And at Yachai, we currently have, will you know, this year have 10 instructors that are K-State instructors teaching at Yachai. So, so we have a lot of back and forth. Hi. Uh, this is a question for all of you. So you guys talk about bridging gaps in culture. And so we have about 100 GO teachers that are going to be going back to Ecuador. And they're going to want to kind of bridge the gap and talk about their experience. But I've been abroad twice, and I know I'm not the only one. But when you go back, often people aren't very receptive of hearing about your time abroad because their life has continued also. And mm -hmm. they know there's this place called Ecuador, but they're not really interested. I wonder what advice you could give them and also myself, because I struggled with this twice. Twice. <laughs> I can't speak. Lo siento. Um, <laughs> dos veces. Uh, how they can kind of tell their you know, family, friends about their experience without being intrusive, about respecting the others. Gracias. Uh, the, the, yeah, the, the interculturation, yeah, into your yeah. own country. And, and, and to an extent, I think the, the bigger uh, hassle, in fact, is when the student goes back and, you know, to, to everybody else, it seems that person is the same, but they have changed so, so much. And this is called, you know, re-entry is much worse in, in terms of cultural shock than the entry into another culture. So. And I, I, think, I think that's where you have to be innovative and you have to find answers that uh, are best suited. And you ha that's where you, you see the diversity of, of uh, uh, acknowledging that there are different answers for different, you know, different people. Eric, you know I don't have the answer. The reacculturation is so difficult going back. And I think many of the teachers have um, experienced difficulty in reacculturation, not only in their schools, but also within their communities. And we often get emails that ask, what can we do to be reaccepted? Uh, and it's, I think, a, a great place for dissertations and a lot of research. I would encourage returning GO teachers to uh, establish, and it's pretty much up to you, to establish networks of returned GO teachers. I know as a returned Peace Corps volunteer, we rely heavily on returned Peace Corps networks. Uh, just, it's kind of like uh, returning veterans. You have somebody that understands what you've been through, so. Mm -hmm. um, anyway. El apoyo que se puedan dar es lo mejor que pueden tener de ustedes mismos. Nadie más compartió esta experiencia con ustedes. Y Entender el biography-driven instruction no es solamente en la clase, no es solamente en la escuela, es también entre ustedes mismos. Y nosotros hablamos mucho aquí en Culture and Language acerca de assumptions and biases. Now, now I'll go back and uh, use um, what we study in Culture and Language to advocate for yourselves. Write another Reflection Wheel journal. <laughs> okay, uh, I think the uh, food is waiting for us. Uh, that's uh, your soup. Uh, please join me in thanking our panel. And as I suggested, get out of your comfort zone. Don't have eight go teachers at one table. Have <laughs> find new people to meet. There's wonderful people throughout the audience, and we would love to get to know you better. Thank you. It's up on the second floor, the ballroom. <laughs> <laughs>